This month, we have raided the LSEIQ archives for an episode from September 2017 that might resonate with those of you who are feeling a little more gloomy than usual, perhaps due to political turmoil and uncertainty, or maybe something more personal. Welcome to LSEIQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. Western societies have been getting steadily richer for several decades, but all the scientific evidence shows that our happiness gauge has refused to budge since about 1950. Although we have more possessions and more opportunities than our grandparents could ever have dreamed of, we're no happier for it. In fact, we now have more depression, more alcoholism and more crime. In this episode, Joanna Bale asks, what's the secret to happiness? Are you happy? Yes, you, right now. Are you listening to this with a big smile on your face or a spring in your step? My guess is that you're probably feeling fair to middling, vaguely content, perhaps hoping for a brighter future, maybe even sad, frustrated or angry. Here's a story that will get you thinking about what really makes you happy. There was once a businessman who was sitting by the beach in a small Brazilian village. As he sat, he saw a fisherman rowing a small boat towards the shore, having caught quite a few big fish. The businessman was impressed and asked the fisherman, how long does it take you to catch so many fish? The fisherman replied, oh, just a short while. The businessman was astonished. Then why don't you stay longer at sea and catch even more? This is enough to feed my whole family, the fisherman said. The businessman then asked, so what do you do for the rest of the day? The fisherman replied, well, I usually wake up early in the morning, go out to sea and catch a few fish then go back and play with my kids. In the afternoon, I take a nap with my wife, and when the evening comes, I join my buddies in the village for a drink. We play guitar, sing and dance throughout the night. The businessman offered a suggestion to the fisherman. I am a PhD in business management. I could help you become an even more successful person. From now on, you should spend more time at sea to try and catch as many fish as possible. When you have saved enough money, you could buy a bigger boat and catch even more fish. Soon you'll be able to afford to buy more boats, set up your own company, your own production plant for canned food and a distribution network. By then, you will have moved out of this village into Sao Paulo, where you can set up an HQ to manage your other branches. The fisherman continues, and after that? The businessman laughs heartily. After that, you can live like a king in your own house. And when the time is right, you can go public and float your shares in the stock exchange and you will be rich. The fisherman asked, and after that? The businessman says, after that, you can finally retire. You can move to a house by the fishing village, wake up early in the morning, catch a few fish, then return home to play with your kids, have a nice afternoon nap with your wife. And when the evening comes, you can join your buddies for a drink, play the guitar, sing and dance throughout the night. The fisherman was puzzled. Isn't that what I'm doing now? This story is from a book called Happiness by Design by Paul Dolan, Professor of Behavioural Science at LSE. He uses it to highlight the paradoxes in our relentless drive for achievement. We'll hear from Paul later. Let's start by looking at the big picture. Professor Lord Richard Layard of LSE's Centre for Economic Performance is a government advisor on mental health and wellbeing. I asked him why our increased wealth over the past 60 years hasn't made us any happier. Well, I think that the biggest reason is actually that although richer people are on average happier than poorer people, um, that's because everybody is comparing their incomes with some general norm. And so if you go uh, through time and think of a country getting richer and everybody getting richer, Um, what happens then is that the norm goes up and uh, nobody becomes much better off relative to the norm than they were before. So I think uh, that is a a pretty much built-in feature of human nature, this tendency to comparison. I think it's very important, again, to discourage it. (laughs) We all become happier if we just enjoyed being who we were rather than thinking how we compared with other people. Um, But it's... uh, probably the main reason why economic growth has not produced the, the happier society many people expected. 
Liz Seidler is the founder and chief executive of the Happy City Initiative, a campaign group set up to challenge the belief that economic growth is the only measure of success in society. Their aim is to encourage communities to put well-being at the heart of public discussions on what it means to truly prosper. Well, for a long time, really, our economic paradigm has said you can narrow it down to one thing. You've got to keep growing. If you keep growing in the economy, in the end, everyone's going to be fine. We're going to have a lovely trickle down and everything will be OK. And I think there is so much evidence now that that's not the case. It doesn't deliver universal well-being in any shape or form. And it's certainly uh, uh, this focus on economic growth as an end goal almost inevitably perpetuates far too much resource use so it's terribly bad for the environment so we have to be really really careful about uh, i really love kate rayworth the economist's um, phrase about we have an economy that grows whether or not we thrive and we need an economy where we thrive whether or not it grows so i'm not pro or anti-growth i just don't think it's an end goal richard layard is also campaigning for more focus on well-being creation rather than wealth creation with his action for happiness movement whose patron is the dalai lama he believes that there is still too much misery that goes unaddressed, while less important issues receive enormous attention. Well, I think what matters to people is how they feel. And uh, it's time that this was recognised by policymakers. Uh, instead of policymakers deciding what's good for people, let's ask people uh, if they're satisfied with their lives and find out what makes people satisfied with their lives. I think that's the democratic way to behave as opposed to a uh, paternalistic way where we decide we know what's good for them and that's what we go about providing. And um, I think you said before that um, we need to focus away from individu in, uh, an individualistic competitive approach to a more cooperative caring approach. Is that not rather utopian? Well I think there are two sides of human nature aren't there? There's the, uh, the very selfish side um, which thinks that each of us is at the centre of the universe. But there's also an altruistic and cooperative side. And I think it's now pretty well established that the uh, reason for the success of mankind, after all, in uh, populating the whole planet and dominating uh, most uh, certainly of the vertebrate species in the world, uh, is our ability to cooperate with each other. And uh, I think that uh, if you want a happy world, you've got to try and support that side of our natures, build on it. Parents have to build on it in their children. Schools have to build on it. Universities should also contribute. Uh, and at the workplace, of course, we should always be trying to appeal to the better side of people instead of the, the worse side. Liz Seidler also defends her mission to encourage local policymakers to create better health and education services, as well as higher quality jobs and urban design. Your critics might say it's a little bit utopian, particularly as um, we're all sort of having to suffer cuts in public services. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it just seems a bit unrealistic, I would imagine, to a lot of people. So how do you get over that idea? Yeah, it, I'm sure it probably does. I think... For me, it's quite unrealistic to think that the current system is helping us to thrive. And if that's not our goal, I don't know what is. So if, if all of the things we do in humanity, whether it's you know, our working practices, our, our public sector or anything else, if they're, if, if they're not all there to help us and our, and our place to thrive, then I really don't know what the point is. So, to, so for me, it's less utopian. It might be a long-term goal. I'm not expecting this to happen overnight. But the idea that we, we shouldn't stop and think, what's it all for? And if it is all for it, are we judging ourselves and measuring that? So measuring what matters and making what matters count, if you like, in that, in that sense. Um, so um, I'm happy to be called utopian if... if, if if people want to call me utopian, I think one of the things we're recognising and seeing for ourselves is that if, if it is utopian, more and more quite hardline people are beginning to jump into that sense of we need to be creating more of a utopia. Um, you know, we've had all sorts of people from, you know, ex-leaders of the Bank of England and ex-Treasury ministers and all the rest of it saying we have to move beyond GDP. We have to be measuring well-being as the core um, measure of success of the country. I asked Richard Layard what needs to happen to make us all happier? 
we need a, a major reversal of the philosophy of education from turning schools into exam factories into uh, turning them into places where people learn to live as well as to earn a living. Uh, we need to change workplaces into places where people uh, uh, cooperate and enjoy their lives. At the moment, uh, this is a shocking finding of happiness research, the least happy time in the day, on average, uh, for people uh, is uh, after commuting, working. People do not, it is a, a fallacy to say that most people like their work. Most academics probably do, but most people don't enjoy their work and it's partly because, here's another extraordinary fact, um, if you ask people who they were with at different times of the day and how happy they were, the least happy time of the day is when you're with your boss. This is shocking. What does it say about our management philosophy? Uh, managers should be inspiring and, uh, uh, and, and uplifting the spirits of their workers rather than downing them, as, as seems to be happening at the moment. Do you, do you think then we need to move away from a sort of more macho culture to a more sort of caring philosophy um, in terms of um, management schools and things like that, business schools and what just... I mean, how do we change that whole workplace culture? Well, um, we need to um, give much more uh, attention to how people feel and how workers feel. Uh, I think that uh, every firm should survey the well-being of its workers. Um, it should publish the findings on the front page of the annual report because actually this is a very good predictor whether the firm will be successful. Uh, so it's neglected by managers at their peril. We should appoint managers for their ability uh, to inspire and to lead and not just for their, their technical capacities. I asked Liz Zeidler if she thinks well-being is finally becoming more of a political priority. We were speaking shortly after the Grenfell Tower fire in West London, as well as the horrific terrorist attacks at Manchester Arena and London Bridge. Liz believes that these tragedies could be a catalyst for change. The world feels to me like it's shifting in the right direction on that, because apart from anything else, things have got so bad. You know, many of the things we've seen in the last few months, some of the awful tragedies we've seen, have just made us realise, I think, quite how, how far off course we are getting. You know, whatever your political background, we can't be seeing the kinds of tragedies we've seen, particularly in this country, in the last few months um, and not say, hang on a minute, something's not working here. And the stark inequalities, the stark, you know, rises in, 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 the, in the anger and desperation that we're seeing around us has to make us stop and think, I think. And I think that sort of shift is helping us to see, let's, let's take it back to basics. What's, you know, what is important? What do we want to be achieving? And if that's important to us, why on earth aren't we measuring it? Paul Dolan is also a government advisor on well-being. He too is optimistic that it is an idea that's gaining ground. He spoke to me via Skype from Ibiza where he was finishing off his latest book on happiness. So the Office for National Statistics are um, routinely now monitoring um, national happiness, if you, want to, if you want to call it that. And so those data are continuing to be gathered irrespective of whether the particular political party or person in power um, is is an advocate of those measures or otherwise. So I think that's a huge resource that will continue to be used by academics and increasingly by policymakers because those data are there. You know, people are going to kind of oh, I wonder what would happen if we looked at this. So so I think there's there's a there's a sort of a a parallel movement in using happiness measures um, quite separately from whether the current political climate uh, would suggest that we um, are in favour or otherwise. Um, I think what's in interesting in, in the recent political uh, climate is that there's some analysis showing that when, if you looked at well-being inequalities within constituencies, so that is essentially looking at the difference between those who are happiest compared to those that are least happy, um, that difference is bigger in areas that were most likely to vote for Brexit. So there is some sense in not only in which wellbeing measures can be used as consequences in themselves, which is where my own interest largely lies, but also in being able to predict and act as a cause 
for some of the other things that policymakers and other people might be interested in. So if the pursuit of wealth and economic growth isn't the secret to happiness, what is it that makes us as individuals happy in our everyday lives? Richard Layard. Well, we know a huge amount about this uh, from surveys in lots and lots of countries. Uh, and it's the same story everywhere, uh, that income explains a very tiny fraction of the variance of happiness across people. The factors which really matter on the external side are your quality of your human relationships, especially in the family. Uh, and then the things which matter on the internal side are obviously your physical health, if it's getting bad, but in particular your mental health. And the thing which we have found, which I suppose is the most striking of all our findings, is that if you want to explain uh, why there are so many people who are unhappy in their lives, um, whose life satisfaction is low, uh, the single factor in every country that explains the largest amount of that is not poverty, it's not unemployment, it is mental illness. And uh, it really is time that that became a central focus of public policy. But surely mental illness may be caused by poverty and unemployment and those kinds of things. Well, of course, we find it holding constant, <laughs> the level of income and holding constant uh, the level of employment. So this is the effect of the mental illness, which is not caused by those factors, but is caused by something else. You, you've been the, the pioneer of um, more talking therapies on the NHS to, to, to try and combat um, Mental, mental illness. Um, I just wondered how that's progressing. Is that something that's now being challenged by austerity? And that no, fortunately, governments on both sides, um, including the Lib Dems, <laughs> have been very supportive of uh, the initiative for adults. So from zero uh, availability of psychological therapy for mild to moderate uh, depression, anxiety disorders, um, in 2008. We are now uh, seeing the NHS uh, treating with evidence-based psychological therapy, 50% recovery rates, uh, over half a million people uh, every year, and that is a commitment to expand that uh, over the next parliament. So that's been going well. The, the really problematic area now is child mental health, because we still have the situation that unless a child is really seriously ill uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, in incredibly uh, anxious or aggressive, they can't be treated because they don't meet the threshold of, uh, of severity. So again, for mild to moderate problems, uh, what I'm pushing for at the moment, and so many other, is a, a child mental health department based in schools but within the NHS, so that they're delivering the nice recommended therapies. So Richard Layard says good mental and physical health and successful relationships make us happy. But those things are sometimes out of our control. I wanted to find out if there's anything we can do differently in our everyday lives to make ourselves happier. As a behavioural psychologist, as well as an economist, Paul Dolan believes we should pay more attention to how the things we do actually make us feel and pay less attention to the narratives that we are told about what we ought to do and feel. So the desire for achievement that is ingrained in many of us from an early age might not necessarily be the route to happiness. His book, Happiness by Design, explains that it's good being motivated to be successful at work, but not at the cost of mental and physical health and personal relationships. A lot of people will say things like, don't sweat the small stuff. It is actually in the small stuff that people can be made happier and can make themselves happier relatively easily. We tend to think of being happier as being something that we need to make big grand life changes. You know, I need to give up my job, I need to move house, I need to leave my partner, I need to, need to go and live in San Francisco. But actually, um, many of those things won't make you much happier for very much longer. Whereas embedding good practices, good habits into your daily routines, listening to music, spending time with people that you like being with, going outdoors, having new experiences, helping other people. That's a really important part of making ourselves happy. All these things that you can do a little bit more of each day would make you happier each day 
and every day thereafter. So what what actually makes you different from other self-help gurus? I mean, the bookshops are full of these self-help books on how to improve your life, how to make yourself happier. What, what do you think makes you different? So I think there's two things that make this a book that's the self-help book to end all self-help books by not being a self-help book. Um, and the first is to be very clear about what happiness is. And in the first part of the book, I make a case for it being in our experiences um, and not just in the experiences that we have that are fun or pleasurable, but those that we have that are fulfilling or purposeful. I talk about pleasure and purpose as a twin set of experiences that each individual needs in order to be happy. Now, it's not that they need them in equal balance and it won't be the same for everybody. But if 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 your life is one that contains almost exclusively pleasure, you could probably be a bit happier if you found something in, in, in your experiences that you found worthwhile, meaningful or purposeful. And equally, it, um, like a lot of LSE academics, if you have a lot of purpose in your life, you could probably be a bit happier just by having a little bit more fun. So I think it's important to be clear in the first instance exactly what happiness is and what it is that we're trying to uh, get more of, if you like. So what happiness by design gets you to do is to think about how you can organize your day in ways that enable you to design in doing some of those things that make you happier and to essentially get out of doing those things that make you feel worse. And to do that through training yourself in the first instance to then let yourself free so you don't have to think very much about it afterwards. Liz Seidler's Happy Cities initiative has created an online tool that measures individual well-being to help people better understand and improve it. She also tries to spread the word across all sections of society. I've gone in and spoken about well-being and happiness in really, really different places. You know, sat with a bunch of lifers in a prison and talked about how they can improve their well-being. Well, you'd expect them to turn around to me, a white middle class educated woman coming in here talking to us about happiness when we're locked up for 22 hours a day. You know, I would understand if they tell me precisely where to go. But actually, we had an amazing conversation because they've got loads of wisdom about it. Of course they have. And and at the end of the, that conversation, one of the one of these gentlemen turned around to me and said, Liz, if I'd known this stuff 10 years ago, I wouldn't be in here. Now, for me, that's a really, really, really stark reminder of how important this stuff is, that actually not looking after our well-being, not stopping and thinking, what really matters to me? What do I need to, to be fulfilled? leads to all sorts of ways that we try and fill that void, whether it's addictions, whether it's crime, whether it's relationship breakdown, whether it's a really unhealthy behaviours that stop our, our own self-care. Finally, I was interested to find out what made each of the three interviewees happy. First off, Richard Layard. Well, I think first you, you need to have a develop a strong inner core, actually, um, through some process of meditation or reflection on what is the real, the real you in, in the heart of yourself, uh, which is not going to be buffeted by the things that happen outside, but is always going to be there um, appreciating the world around. But I, I, I do also think that um, if you focus your life on trying to make other people happier, um, that's good for them, but it's also good for you. And that's very much what Action for Happiness is trying to stress. Here's Paul Dolan. Well, one of the things that that, um, that through the success of Happiness by Design doesn't make me happy is being asked what makes me happy. Um, but, um, so leaving that to, to one side, um, I think, I mean, t- take the gym as an example. It, for, for, for me, it's um, it's an opportunity and, a, and a, about the only opportunity where my mind is, is almost entirely um, focused on the activity in hand. It's essentially mindfulness for me. I mean, people talk about, the, you know, going on, um, mindfulness training uh, weeks and weekends and meditation camps and and that's fine for them but 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 for me that that would be far too effortful so um, for me chucking heavy weights around in a gym is a way of just focusing and paying attention in that moment so I think aside from the physical benefits that come um, from that activity it gives me an enormous sense of mental well-being by being able to just free my mind up to just concentrate on what I'm doing and finally Liz Seidler. 
I suppose like doctors who don't look after their own health, I find myself, you know, getting so, so busy, running around like a mad thing. And I do forget to do those things. So I'm not here to um, be any kind of paragon of virtue. I used to go to a choir, which was amazing for me. I don't know if you know about the five ways to well-being, but they're very well-researched areas of life that can help you and they're connect with other people, learn, uh, be active, notice, be more mindful of what's around you and giving. And I found being in the choir, I did all of those things. So, you know, really connect with other people. It's really good fun. Learned all the time. Had to learn lots of new songs and the rest of it. Really active, up singing and the rest of it. You really, really notice the impact it has on the on the audience, on each other and all the rest of it. And giving all the time because you're singing for other people was amazing. Of course, I'm now feeling like I'm so busy. How often do I go to choir? Almost never. You know, so I'm a, I'm a massive hypocrite. My, one of the biggest things for me is finding time to be in nature, even tiny little bits of it. So whether it's, you know, finding a weekend to go away, which is fantastic, hear the ocean or listen to the rustle of the trees, or even in the working day, I try even on my busiest, busiest days to take 10 or 15 minutes in the little scruffy urban park around the corner from our offices and just sit on the grass, ideally, or somewhere, even if it's raining, sit under the trees, just take five or 10 minutes just to kind of be a little bit in a green space. Makes a massive difference to me. It won't work for everyone, but it certainly works for me. Our experts agree that well-being and happiness are an essential part of a well-functioning society and should be given a much higher priority by policymakers and by ourselves. They prioritise their own well-being by regularly taking time out of their busy lives to do the things that make them happy and try to encourage others to do the same. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was produced by Joanna Bale, Tom Williams and Shanice Forbes-Taylor. Our narrator was James Ratti. It was based in part on the following research. Happiness by Design, Finding Pleasure and Purpose in Everyday Life by Paul Dolan and The World Happiness Report, edited by John Helliwell, Richard Layard and Geoffrey Sachs. We are taking a break for December, but join us in the new year when we ask, how can we stop knife crime? For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover. 